Hello out there, folks, and welcome to our Revere Veterans and Community Show. Today we have a real special guest. He's the father of a Medal of Honor recipient, and his name is Mr. Paul Monte, who came all the way from Rainham, Massachusetts, in this terrible weather. So, Paul, thank you for coming. Pleasure to see you. Now, before we start the show, I would like to say one thing about Mr. Monte. If it wasn't for him, none of us in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, none of us would be able to put a flag at Bourne National Cemetery. So, Mr. Monte, tell us a story about that. We would love to hear it. Well, my, my son was killed in June of 2006, and um, we buried him at the National Cemetery in Bourne so that he would be surrounded by his fellow uh, service members. And that following November Veterans Day, uh, I did as most people around the Commonwealth do, uh, brought a flag down to Bourne to put on his grave. Um, and I was stunned as I entered the cemetery and found there were no flags on any graves in that cemetery. We had um, 56,000 graves and not one of them had a flag on it. And that was very surprising to me because I know that the state law says that every veteran's grave has to have a flag on it on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. But upon inquiry with the administration of the cemetery, I was told uh, two things. One, that the property was not state property and was not subject to state law. Uh, it was federal property. And two, that the reason that flags weren't allowed on the graves was because they interfered with the maintenance of the cemetery. Uh, I was very upset with that reason and uh, set out to change that policy and after uh, contacting every veterans group in the country and um, state senators and congress people and talked to generals and my own federal uh, congressmen and senators um, it took four and a half years before we were able to get permission to place those flags um, we were conditional, of course, uh, that we had to purchase those flags, we had to put those flags in, and we had to take those flags out. So my brother Matthew and I uh, began a campaign to raise funds um, to buy 56,000 flags, and uh, we went on the radio and newspapers and whatever we could do, um, visiting different um, VFWs, American Legions, we ran some functions and we were able to raise enough money thanks to the good people of the state of Massachusetts as well as people from other states I must add um, that donated bits and pieces along the way and uh, we were able to raise the funds and buy those flags and um, on Memorial Day 2011 uh, we went down and we put 56,000 flags at the cemetery in Bourne and we have done it every Memorial Day and Veterans Day since. Um, and this coming Saturday, November 9th, um, 2013, will be the sixth time we have placed the flags on all the graves in the cemetery in Bourne. I want to thank you for doing that, Mr. Monty. And I would like to speak to the people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. If you would like to, if you have a veteran buried there, a relative buried there, make sure you donate to Mr. Monty because his group is the one that puts the flags on. And tell him how they can do that, Paul, please. Well, yeah, you can, uh, you can contribute by um, sending us a check um, at um, Paul Monty, P-A-U-L-M-O-N-T-I, 408 Center Street, C-E-N-T-E-R, in Rainham. That's R-A-Y-N-H-A-M, Massachusetts, 02767. Uh, if you send us a check, you want to make it out to the SFC, that stands for Sergeant First Class, SFC, Jared, J-A-R-E-D, C, as in Christopher, Monty, M-O-N-T-I, the SFC, Jared, C, Monty, Charitable Foundation. The SFC, Jared, C, Monty, Charitable Foundation. Um, in the memo of your check, you want to simply write Flags for Vets, which is our program. We actually run three separate programs. Uh, our number one program is our scholarship program, where we give scholarships at a local high school and also at Fort Drum in uh, upstate New York. Uh, our second program is a program 
called Celebrate the Military Child, where we um, give parties for military children, especially those whose parents are deployed overseas, so that they can have a birthday party or a party for a holiday uh, that they normally wouldn't have. And our third program, of course, is our program called Oper Operation Flags for Vets. Anyone that wants to donate online can also do that. Um, you can donate through PayPal. If you go to our website, uh, www.sfcjaredcmonte.com, um, you can donate through PayPal online. And we would appreciate anything we get. Um, as I said, we are now placing over 57,000 flags in the graves. Um, the flags have been in now five times. They're getting a little frayed. We don't like that at all. We have just purchased an additional 10,000 flags for the cemetery, um, and we have to begin to um, retire some of the older flags that have been out for, six, for three years. Paul, can I ask you two questions, sir? Yes, sir. I do not know how to work a computer. If I wanted to mail you a check, what address would I be mailing it to? Well, I just gave that information. Again, it's Paul Monty, 408 Center Street, C-E-N-T-E-R, Rainham, R-A-Y-N-H-A-M, Massachusetts, 02767. Thank you. You're welcome. And you also mentioned when I met you at the Bonfiglio Funeral Home, when you were talking about the flags. Yes, sir. That there were only two companies, one in Georgia, I believe, and one in Texas, if my memory serves me. Yes, that's correct, sir. When, when we decided to purchase flags for our veterans. Um, we had looked at various places and one of the stunning things was most of the flags were made in foreign countries. Um, so my brother Matthew went on a search and could find only two companies in the entire United States that made their flags here. Uh, one in Texas, one in Georgia. And so all our flags come from Georgia and the wood, the material to make the flag, the stitching, the dye, everything on that flag, uh, down to the staples, is made and assembled here in the United States of America. Right. Now, as it should be. I'm a curious little old fellow, if I may say so. You had, did you find, when you first started going out to put the flags on the, for the graves of the veterans, Yes, sir. did you come across any, if I can use the word, obstacles along the road? Well, we did not get a lot of cooperation from the administration of the cemetery. They were very much against what we were doing. And what reason would they have for that? I think probably it was more cost-effective uh, things for them. Mowing the lawn was so much easier since that cemetery has no headstones. Um, it's, it's very, very flat because it's all nothing but footstones. So mowing the lawn was very easy unless there was an obstacle in the way, like a flag. So they told us that um, the flags were dangerous because if they mowed over them, that the flags would act like projectiles and, oh, I see. and so on. Um, they also told us that um, they honored the veterans by putting flags along the avenue leading into the cemetery, which they called the Avenue of Flags. Um, other than that, the only obstacles were to get enough people so that we could get that cemetery flagged in a reasonable amount of time and then picking up the flags a week later. Um, they actually told us that we had to pick up the flags four days later, which um, would have been on a Tuesday and we never would have had anything in terms of volunteers there on a Tuesday and I usurped them myself and said, no, we're going to leave the flags in for two weekends because people come down to visit their friends and relatives on the weekends and so we now pick up the flags on the Sunday. So flags always go in on the Saturday before Memorial Day and the Saturday before Veterans Day and they always come out the Sunday after Memorial Day and the Sunday after Veterans Day. All right, thank you Paul. You're very welcome sir. Paul, I'm going to ask you something. I hope it's not too emotional for either, both of us because we both lost sons. But yours was a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, Jarrett C. Monty. Sure. Could you tell us how that all happened? I know it happened in Vietnam, if you can talk about it. Well, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but um, Jared was on his second deployment to Afghanistan. Um, 
he had already been deployed twice to South Korea, once to Kosovo, and uh, once to Afghanistan, and this was his second deployment to Afghanistan. The U.S. military had detected a, um, an al-Qaeda stronghold uh, in the mountains near Goadesh, Afghanistan, uh, and it was right on the Pakistani border. So it was an entryway for al-Qaeda from Pakistan into Afghanistan. Um, and so the U.S. decided that we needed to take out that outpost that the Taliban um, were holding. So Jared and uh, his 15-man crew were uh, given the task of being the forward observers for the military attack into that valley. So um, they began on a Sunday uh, being dropped off at the bottom of a mountain that was 8,000 feet high and in full uniform with packs up to 70 pounds and more they began to climb that mountain. Uh, they climbed mostly um, in the early part of the day and at night to avoid detection and to avoid the heat of the day because the temperatures there were over 100 degrees. Wow. So for three days they climbed that mountain. <coughs> they finally reached a plateau on the top of what was labeled Hill 2610. And there they set up to observe the compound below. Um, but after a three-day climb and sweltering temperatures with all those packs on, they were out of water and almost out of food. So they had called back to headquarters to have a resupply and were told that the resupply would take place um, when the attack into the valley began so that the helicopter dropping the supplies would be masked by those going into the valley. Now unfortunately uh, because of a lack of equipment in Afghanistan because most of it at the time was in Iraq um, the attack into the valley had to be postponed because one of the helicopter pilots got sick. So here were the 16 soldiers stuck on this plateau, um, smaller than a football field, 8,000 feet up in a mountain with no water and very little food. So the Army decided to send their supplies in anyway. And the helicopter that came in came in way too close, only 150 yards away and dropped the supplies. And they noticed that those in the compound down below in the valley were watching with military-style binoculars. Um, and so they were marked and they knew it. Uh, upon retrieving their food and water, they had to decide whether to go back down the mountain or complete their mission on top of the mountain and they decided that it would be better to stay on top of the mountain and complete their mission rather than start climbing down and abort the mission for one thing and also be at the mercy of the enemy firing down upon them. That evening as the sun began to set they heard rustling in the leaves of the woods around them. Now this plateau was pretty much barren. It had a few rocks on it and a few small trees but it was surrounded by a wooded area. So as they heard this rustling, um, and then eventually could hear voices whispering, um, suddenly the air erupted with machine gun fire, small arms fire, and rocket propelled grenades. Uh, so fierce was the uh, enemy um, fire that some of our own soldiers had their weapons shot out of their hands, or couldn't even move to get a weapon that was two feet away. In the early part of the battle, one of the snipers with them, a young man by the name of Patrick Liburt, um, who had held off the enemy, uh, was shot in the head and he was killed. Jared and his co-leader, Sergeant Christopher Cunningham, then made a head count of the soldiers on the hill and found that one was missing. They couldn't account for a young private, 22-year-old private, by the name of Brian Bradbury. So in the, in the lull in the fire from the enemy, uh, they began to call out Brian's name. 
and eventually heard a very soft voice, very weak voice, saying that I'm hit, I'm down, I can't move. Brian was stuck in the middle of that plateau in a very small depression. Sergeant Cunningham turned to Jared and said, I'm going out to get Brian. And Jared looked back at Chris and said, no, you're not. He's my boy. I will get him. In the meantime, uh, the enemy was trying to flank our soldiers. That has come in on their side. And uh, Jared drove them back with his rifle and with some grenades that he threw. He then got on his headset and called back to headquarters for uh, mortar fire, for artillery fire, and for danger close air support. Danger close air support, if, if you don't know, is when they drop the munitions um, so close that even our own uh, soldiers are in danger as they explode. But it was necessary at this time because the enemy was so close. Um, so Jared called that in, then took off his headset and handed it to a fellow soldier and told that soldier, you are now Chaos 3-5. That was Jared's call sign so that the person on the other end knew that it was a continuous call and not a separate call. He then tightened his chin strap and ran out to try to get Brian. The enemy fire was so intense that Jared was driven back behind a small rock. Being the kind of person that he was, that is, someone that would never ever give up, someone that always tried his hardest at everything he did, someone that always had to do the right thing, and the right thing was to go get Brian. So Jared rose up a second time and went out to try to get Brian. This time, more of the enemy fire was directed at him as they now knew where he was and he was driven back behind the rock again. But Jared's never give up attitude took prominence over everything. And after telling his other shoulders, soldiers to give him cover fire, he headed out to get Brian a third time. Now it seemed that every single enemy was trained on him because everyone knew where he was. And as he went out to get Brian, he was hit with a rocket propelled grenade and went down. As he lay there bleeding, his fellow soldiers called to him, Monty, Monty, come on, you can make it, you can get back here. But he was so badly injured, he was not able to crawl back to a position of safety. As he expired, he told his soldiers, excuse me, that's okay. You want to fish him? No, I'm fine. He told his soldiers two things. First, he said, I made my peace with God. And secondly, he told them, tell my family that I love them. And we love them too. Thank you. Would you like to show the people of the city of Revere a picture of your son, Paul? Sir. Sure. Would you like to read the bottom of this to, to them, if you wish? No. It's just, this is the citation for the Medal of Honor. It's Jared with the Medal of Honor. Can you zero in on this picture of a son from the TV studio, if possible? Is it possible? Oh, it's terrific. How old was he, if I may ask you? Jared was 30 at the time. Yep. My son was 31, I want to see that. Not married because Jared had always told me, he said, Dad, I'm not going to get married while I'm in the service. He said, there's no way. He said, I don't want to leave a widow and, and orphans behind. So. It says, the United States of America, to all who shall see these presents, greeting. This is to certify that the President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to Staff Sergeant Jared C. Monty for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in action with the enemy. 
in Nuristan Province, Afghanistan, on June 21, 2006, given under my hand in the city of Washington, this 17th day of September, 2009, and it's signed by President Barack Obama. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Morris. Thank you. Before we continue, Paul, I would like to say one thing. <coughs> I'm a little emotional, too. <laughs> From the people of Revere, for you coming down, we would like to donate a check for the flags for the veterans at Bourne. Veterans Thank National you. Cemetery. Thank you, Morris. Thank you very, very much. This is from the city of Revere, and I hope every city in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, town, city, outlet, whatever, sends some money to Mr. Paul Monty so the flags can be put on on all the veterans. As you mentioned, there are 57,000 now? 57, over 57,000. Over 57. So. Thank you, Revere. Right. God bless you all. You are truly patriots of this great country of ours. Right. And thank you the people of Revere, from us, from the Senior Center. And by the way, you donated this to the Revere Senior Center, yes, I believe? Yes, this, this has been donated to the Senior Center in Revere. So if you people who have never come to the Senior Center, we do have a wall there of heroes, and this will definitely go on the wall of one of them, if not the greatest of heroes. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Paul, we have about six minutes. Why don't you take a few minutes, like three or four or five, if you want to, all you need, <laughs> and tell us what you would like to see the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts do for veterans and for you. For me, nothing. That's not. I, I don't need anything. Um, I mean, to help you is what I. It's think. not about me, but for the veterans. Monday is Veterans Day. You can do one of three things, or all three, if you wish. First of all, if you see a veteran, please go up to them, shake their hand, and thank them for their service. Because without them, we would not be a free country. We would not have the freedoms that we have. Second thing, if you can't do the first, go to a local cemetery. Visit a grave with a flag on it, because all the, flags of our, all the graves of our veterans will have a flag on it on Veterans Day. Just stand in front of it and thank that veteran. And thirdly, if that's not possible, find a quiet moment in your home and just bow your head and thank the veterans for their service and what they've done for this country. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to ask something. With the holidays approaching us fast, a lot of our living veterans will be looking for jobs. So if you people out there would like to hire someone, make sure you hire a veteran because it's a beautiful bet to hire a vet. Remember that, and they are well versed in taking disciplinary orders and they will be good workers. So Paul. I'd also, I'd also like to make people aware of what's happening with our veterans from the Iraq-Afghani war at this time. A very, very serious uh, thing is happening. There are over 25 suicides of veterans every single day. Not every week or every month or every year, but 25 suicides per day nationwide. These veterans are coming home. They have very serious PTSD problems. It is extremely difficult for them to adjust back into civilian life. And we need to become aware of this, and we need to get these veterans help. It's sad for someone to go overseas and fight for his country and face death over and over again and then come home and be ignored. They need help and only we can do that. Only we can provide that help for them. Right, Paul. Thank you. I would like to say one more thing, if I may, which you mentioned at the beginning of the show to me before we went on the air, that when you needed to get help to put the flags on the Bourne National Cemetery, the one that okayed it was who is our sen uh, Secretary of State now. That's correct. Senator John Senator Kerry. Senator John Kerry. So he helped you, and now he's trying to help he our country make peace correct. in the Middle East. Correct. John Kerry is a, is a great patriot. I know there's been a lot of controversy about John, um, 
But he's I think, a great hero to but me I, too. But I think that's that's something that happens whenever you get in the limelight. Someone's going to stir up the, the waters and make them muddy. Uh, he served in Vietnam. He right. was decorated. I believe um, the Bronze Star. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bronze Star recipient. Um, he has been a very loyal senator to all our veterans in this country, and uh, now serving as Secretary of State, trying to bring peace to the world. Right. And he's doing a very, very good job at that. Right. So, yeah, it was through the actions of John Kerry and former Senator Scott Brown, right. who also helped, and they, they collaborated together and got us permission to put those flags. And I, I commend them both for that. I got to tell you, we have the best heroes. I know this is going to be a little mets a mets, but we have the best heroes and the best people right here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I can say that because I come from the Big Apple from New York. I came from a big city to a little town, but it may be this little town is bigger than the biggest city in the country. So for Revere, thank you for letting me live here. Yeah. I, I don't like to be prejudiced, but what I've found in Massachusetts, in New England, is you are exactly right. We were the first patriots, and we're still the best patriots. You're absolutely right, Paul. And with that, I want to thank you for coming up here. I want to say God bless you. God thank bless you, your son, but especially your son for all he did for our country. God bless our troops, the people of Revere. But most of all, God bless our great country, the United States of America. And don't forget, if you wish to donate for the flags and you can live in Revere, you could drop it off at the Revere Veterans Service, 249. Our American Legion, or you could drop it off at the Revere Senior Center, but whatever you do, help us with the flags, and thank you again, and thank you, Paul, again for showing up. Thank you for having me, Mark.